loud and clear, brother. Loud and clear. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, at first I wasn't hearing I wasn't hearing your intro or anything. But oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but uh I'm centered okay for you. Oh, everything's good, man. Everything's just as perfect as it was. Okay. Yes, indeed. I'm trying to get uh Yeshua in the picture a little bit. So uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, folks got all these other images everywhere. I know he ain't got blue eyes and blonde hair, but eh, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. How how's that? Yeah, perfect, man. That's perfect. Okay. Leave it just that. You sent it just okay. right. All but right. Now we're ready to roll. I have to find this video. Um I have yeah, all this time to get things done, and it's just like for some reason I always kind of get a brain fart with that. But no, we're going to have that yeah. momentarily. But in the meantime, tell everybody how you've been doing. Yeah. And okay. um, we all get right. that little well, small yeah. Well, greetings to everybody uh, in the chat room. Greetings to you, brother Lance. Good to uh, chop it up with you again today. And uh, <laughs> it was an interesting weekend. You know, I was uh, able to. Uh, you know, look at a few things. I'm, I'm always looking at things from a different perspective when I when I actually interact with it. So they have yes. um, they have what they call the Day of the Dead uh, here. The Latinos celebrate it, but it's actually a um, tradition that our people started in the motherland. It's very similar. Wow. But, and, and yeah, and also um, in South America, I remember a couple of years ago, this lady was talking about the fact that uh, she went to South America and mm -hmm. uh, she saw them acting out this, you know, the day of the dead, carrying the caskets and painting their faces and everything. And she said it, she had just seen in uh, Africa a celebration similar to that, like three months prior. So when she came back to America, she started putting things together and found out that uh, it was a uh, Mexican uh, holiday that was actually the same as the one practiced in the motherland. I was like, yeah, I can believe that. But uh, being out there at night with these people painted, you know, like uh, goblins and looking all ghoulish and everybody, you know, out there dressed like, you know, that movie, uh, Day of the Dead or, you know, right. the dead walking or what have you. And that's why it's so popular. But there was so many people out there, man, that night. And I came home that night and I said, I, we need to talk about this European <laughs> holiday. Because, <laughs> you know, Black folks take it to a whole different level. Whereas, with anything. Huh? When they roll with something, they got to take it beyond. Oh, yeah, way beyond. Way beyond. But you know what Let I found out, too, Brother Lance? Um, mm -hmm. I found out, too, that um, two-thirds of the year, um, we celebrated something, and mainly something in nature. Uh-huh. And that, that is behind why black people like to party so much. So I took a deep dive into this subject and uh, it, it's, it's gonna be interesting. Some of the things I uncovered just by you know dealing with these holidays, um, all of us know, pretty much know the things that have happened, but I wanna mm -hmm. give a different perspective on it as well. So, uh, <clears throat> Again, I want to greet everybody in the chat room. I hope everybody had a good, productive weekend. And yes. uh, hopefully this presentation will get a chance to talk about uh, some of the many, many narratives that um, have us functioning the way that we function. So I don't know if you found the video yet, brother. Oh, I got it. I'm, I'm, oh, okay, I'm okay. Yeah, so, it, um, yeah, so this video is going to um, explain um, what I believe is the missing link for our people when it comes to religion. Okay, because many of us, um, even though we probably have heard this before, we, we are always taught that this is some type of pagan or, you know, 
which pagan is nothing more than, you know, something that comes out of a culture. So yeah, go ahead, brother. It's gonna it's gonna set up the presentation, and then we'll take it. I'll take it from there. Move this uh, banner here with your information, so you can have okay. a full screen. I think we can see everything. Nothing's blocked. We'll put it back later on. I'll just open that up like that, and um, we're ready to roll. Here we go. All right. All right. Let me add this in. Mm -hmm. Full screen. Okay. Cool. Let's get this started. Make sure the sound is good. As far back as 10,000 BC, history is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood the crops would not grow and life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or god, God's son, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the 12 constellations represented places of travel for God's son and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set, and Set was the personification of the darkness or night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher, and at the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the Virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death, was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. 
He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world who subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why 12 disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher at 12. At the age of 30, he was baptized by John the Baptist and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples, which he traveled about with, performing miracles, such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which on December 24th aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the Three Kings follow the star in the east in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo is also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to House of Bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There's another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the Northern Hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and gets smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. For the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter, this is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the twelve disciples. They are simply the twelve constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. 
In fact, the number 12 is replete throughout the Bible. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac. This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross, for Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world, the risen Savior who will come again, as it does every morning, the glory of God who defends against the works of darkness as he is born again every morning and can be seen coming in the clouds up in heaven with his crown of thorns or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures, there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur in a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150 year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshiping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshiping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Ares, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the last Passover would be, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. 
This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28:20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3,500 years ago on the walls at the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth, and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. And the plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets, and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. Brother Neil, let me ask you something, brother. Okay. Is the video playing? I'm, I'm, I'm told the video's not playing, but from my end, it's playing. Yeah, I but, see it. And you, is it playing for you over there? Yeah, it's playing for me. Okay, okay. Okay, let me just go ahead and let it keep on playing because I got some reports that it had actually stopped playing, possibly because of a copyright. Because we got to investigate these videos before we put it up, but it's playing, so I'm going to yeah. keep on playing. They usually don't strike you down right away, but they'll they'll strike it after, you know. But we want to avoid right. that. But I'm gonna, 
Yeah. We got a few more minutes left, so I'm going to continue playing it. Okay. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shall not steal. I have not killed, became thou shall not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shall not bear false witness, and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, When we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. Okay, Brother Neil, you could see it. I can see it. I guess because we're on the stream, but everybody else can't see it. And it cut maybe, maybe seven minutes ago, maybe nine minutes ago. They can't see it. The stream is going on, but for us, but it said that it cut off. So, wow. um, yeah, because this is probably a copywritten, you know. Okay. You, you know, so, I know about this. I thought it was uh, just for music. Say it again. I thought the, the copyright infringement was uh, basically for music when you play them on, on the video on the YouTube. Oh, no, 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 no. It, it's for anything online. It could, be a, it, could be a, it could be a homemade video. And if you don't agree, there's a place where you can check to say if you allow it to be played and in, in remixed and played in, in pieces and parts. And there's um, people, some, some allow it, some don't. They give you right. that choice. So that has to be investigated before we, we play it. Okay. Because when, when YouTube okay. detects it, they'll that shut it down. Yeah. So for most most people, they, they haven't seen anything for the most part. They got a couple minutes in, uh -huh. and then it cut. And yeah. um, they say, that, yeah, the stream has ended. So I'm going to... um. Okay. We'll continue on, but I want to see who, who can continue on. Because if this stream is cut for most people and they can't hear us talking now, then we're wow. going to have to start on... Yeah. So um okay. for the people for the people in the chat room, can you hear? I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna take this off. Can you hear us talking now? Can you see Brother Neil right now just as he is? Because you know, they're getting real strict with everything. So you just it's not just music, it's anything. And they have to give permission, you know, because then they're gonna YouTube's gonna co uh, contact me. It's not gonna hurt the channel really, but they're gonna say, Oh, we have to give you a copyright strike for playing this video. So uh, you get enough of them, the whole channel's gone. So let me well, get to the chat. We won't play any more videos then, because I know they get real childish with things. Yeah, I mean, but see, they, that's their. We in their house. That's their rules. Yeah. And um, if they say that, and we walk into it, you know, then um, that's true. Okay, I'm not getting any feedback really from anybody here. They they might have kicked out the whole stream, and I think I see the stream on you, and it's like me and you talking, but. It's probably let me see. Let me see now. Let me just go see independently through my phone. Okay. If it's if it's still on. Okay, I can you know. check my uh iPad. Uh-huh. Okay, let me see something here. Okay. We have 17 people and we have more, and um, maybe they're just okay. Riri says we're back. I, mean, I hope she means we're back like you can see me or or, or are you back? Okay, they, yeah, they can they can hear us now, but can you see us? Can, can you see Brother Frazier on the screen? Because I took the video down. So what's going to happen on the replay, I'm going to probably just have to cut a lot of that part out until you start okay. really talking. I just had to okay. doctor that up. It's on the replay, if, the, if it gets cut out, they're going to lose interest. And just like right. you know, big screen, they're just gonna leave. So really, right. this is the real, this is the real beginning right now. Okay. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll doctor that up after this is ready. Um, you know, because it takes a couple hours to get ready. So okay. um, good. Everybody can see. All right. 
So just start it right now at this point and um, just get right into it and explain what, what we did see in the video to bring people up for what you wanted to show. Okay. Okay. So I'll shut up right now. Go on ahead. Greet everybody again, just like it's the very beginning on a fresh okay. new video. Go ahead, All brother. right. Well, thank you, brother Lance. Uh, glad to be with you again on Monday. I hope uh, everybody had a great weekend. Hello to everyone in the chat room. Um, basically, the uh, video that I showed was talking about where all of the uh, religious narratives and concepts originated from. And in the last video, we talked about the stolen legacy. And this just kind of reinforces the fact that um, even with the subject we're going to talk about today, uh, the celebration of European holidays, plantation theology, and the worship of false idols. Um, <clears throat> when we look back into antiquity, we look at, just to give a brief synopsis of how this story that we um, really live by, how it came to be. There were comparisons between uh, Heru or Horus, okay, and uh, Jesus. And it showed all of the different attributes that they have, okay, it's sort of like being born of a virgin, having 12 disciples, and also um, being resurrected from the dead, okay. And all of this came out of our people's brilliant uh, observation of the universe and the stars, the sun, everything was centered around the sun. And this is where the original concept that you know as religion today came from. So it's very uh, in-depth video. I wish we were able to look at it. Um, but the bottom line is that everything that you know today, including uh, these European holidays, basically came from this original concept that our ancestors uh, originated. So uh, we're gonna jump right in to the subject today, celebration of European holidays, plantation theology and the worship of false idols. And as I was telling Lance uh, earlier when we were talking, that I went to um, the celebration that um, Latinos have called uh, the Day of the Dead, where they have the casket, everybody's dressed up. And, you know, it's sort of like a, a Halloween celebration. And so when I got back that night, I started thinking about how black people, the things that we celebrate, why do we celebrate them? and looking at how this tradition that we grew up in, how it affects us and, and what areas it affects us in. And then I'm gonna break down each one of these holidays so that we could um, have a clear understanding and comprehension of how we are affected by these celebrations. And we are uh, affected in a mighty way. But one of the uh, statistics I wanted throw out real quickly was uh, from NPR and also from the uh, labor and consumer statistics that uh, in 2020, black people spent between 17 and 20% uh, more, okay, than all other cultures in America during the holiday season. And then uh, we spent 24%, it increased to 24% when you include shopping online. So clearly um, the holidays affect us or impact us in a more profound way than you know all other cultures, although these cultures celebrate the same way we do. There's something about why this is such an intrinsic uh, part of our culture, and we're gonna examine that today. Um, it, the other thing I discovered was that all of uh, these uh, holidays that we celebrate, 
is rooted in fear. Um, I'll give you an example because um, from the European mind, everything that he dealt with had some type of element of fear. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, we, the difference is that in, in the European mind, all of these holidays were based in fear, where um, they were afraid of their um, ancestors coming back, you know, as a ghost, as a spirit. This is why we have all these movies where people are frightened, okay, which we have incorporated um, by so-called spirits, or they always saw this battle with uh, evil spirits in terms of them manifesting themselves. In contrast, we want our and we want to invoke the spirit of our ancestors. This is why we pour lib libations. Okay, so there's a big contrast here in terms of how you know we we want to invoke the spirits of our ancestors. This is what Vudan was about. And this concept comes from our concept of the Netaru, okay? It's the uh, male and female goddess, god and goddess that ruled everything in nature. So let's look at uh, these European holidays and let's look at the characteristic or the attribute of fear that's ingrained in these holidays that we um, particularly don't discuss, but it affects black people in a very profound way. Um, the first one we're gonna look at is Thanksgiving or what I call misgiving, okay? And uh, it was the slaughter of the indigenous uh, Paraquat people. But more importantly, the fear that they had was the fear of starving, that once once they were taught by the Paraquat how to um, plant and harvest, then they didn't need them anymore. Um, just like everything else, they, the Paraquat Indians were expendable. And so they looked at it like, okay, well, we want all, there's always an element of greed involved in the European psyche. Well, we're going to have all this food that we plant for ourselves when it harvests. And you're not going to be around to take any food from us. So this was the thanks that they got. And it's misgiving because we miss, and just like the uh, miseducation of the Negro that Carter G. Woodson uh, talked about, because we follow the narratives of, of a specific culture without examining what it is, what its origin is, and more importantly, how it affects us, then all of these things we incorporate into our lives without ever looking at the deeper meaning, okay, which you have the ability to do because you saw on that video and we know that you were the first scientist, okay? And so you had this ability, this ability was taken away from you based on all of the um, different ways that you have been indoctrinated specifically with European uh, holidays and the fears ingrained in them. And, and the reason why I call it a plantation theology is because this was where the original indoctrination of all of these holidays came from. I remember hearing one of the slaves say uh, that the holidays was the only time that they were basically caught a break. So this was another way in which this was ingrained into our psyche. And so through our genetic memory bank, just like any type of uh, past trauma, it's passed down through the genes, just like uh, a condition like diabetes. Okay, so this is very misgiving because, and, and you know, I get it. Okay, we, we come together as families during this holiday. We were raised in this country with these European traditions. 
but at the same time, there, there is a misgiving about the actual event itself. This is a historical event. This is not Neil Frazier or Lance Gurr saying this. This is uh, one of your own scholars. Um, just like when you examine uh, Kemetic uh, concepts, you know, we're thankful to, to Joel A. Rogers, uh, a European man who had the courage to tell the truth, okay, about a lot of things. Um, David uh, uh, Basil Davidson, an, another European historian who also um, told us what, you know, what was actually going on in terms of the European mindset. Okay, uh, let's look at Christmas, okay, or Xmas, what I call it. There are actually 16 crucified saviors. And one of the thing, things that the video that we tried to play earlier talked about was that all 16 of these crucified saviors had the exact same uh, attributes um, of Jesus. But Jesus was the last one in line, okay? And it began with uh, Horus in 3000 BC, okay? There was Horus, um, Mithra, Dionysus, uh, the Greek god or goddess. And then there was uh, Mithra, there was uh, Coxicodal, okay? There were... Um, it was uh, Barley of Afghanistan. So all of these 16 uh, crucified saviors um, had the exact same attributes. And so for you to choose one out of history, okay, and then say this is the one that is different or better or whatever than all the rest is a misnomer because these attributes were deliberately taken from these uh, ancient uh, uh, crucified saviors um, and they were worshiped in their own culture as such. Um, the, other, the other thing about this was that uh, as what we know as Christmas was actually the celebration of the winter solstice, as, as we saw in the video where the sun actually goes south for three days and it's basically behind the horizon <clears throat> and, uh, on the 21st and then uh, the 22nd and then uh, on the 25th, it begins to emerge again and you see this crux or this, you can align the uh, symbol of a cross to the, um, the astronomical alignment, okay? And, and this is what our people, this was the brilliant conceptual uh, theology of our people, not a plantation uh, theology. Um, <clears throat> the 4th of July, okay? Um, basically, in 1852, you just need to listen to Frederick Douglass's speech from 1852 in terms of that holiday. But again, let's go back before, um, well, now let me finish the list and then we'll go back and we'll discuss it. Uh, so one of, the, one of the main things, oh, Easter, which is uh, basically a German taken from the German uh, term, uh, Ostern, okay? And, and this was the, uh, it was the German worship of the, uh, of the spring goddess, Osterus, okay? This is where Easter comes from. The Germans were the ones that came up with this concept of the, uh, the bunny that, that you still, you know, put our kids through without understanding and comprehending what all of this meant. And these different attributes that went, that goes with these European holidays, they all have a certain significance that's outside of your realm 
of existence. Um, again, you know, Thanksgiving, the way that that affects us is that there, this is a time when black people come together like all other people, families come together, they celebrate, they eat turkey and dressing and all the other stuff that goes along with this without the knowledge of what happened to their ancestors on this day. And that this day did not originally, this is why it's misgiving, it did not originally mean what you're celebrating today. This is what the, you were taught on the plantation, which is a lie. That is not a historical fact. There was, the, the feast was after the Paraquat Indians were slaughtered. Well, I don't like to call them Indians. The indigenous black Paraquat Indians were slaughtered. And then there was a celebration behind that. Um, so let, let's look at Christmas uh, more so than any other day. We know that um, during this time, and I looked at the statistics, that black men commit more um, robberies and crimes that land them into prison simply because they want to be able to buy gifts for people to show that, you know, for whatever reason, we have money or whatever the reason is, and also based on the tradition as well. Okay, the, the problem with that is that the original purpose of that, this gift giving, had nothing to do with what you think is something, uh, the birthday of Jesus, okay? It had nothing to do with that. So this is not the birthday of, uh, of Christ, okay? This, this is not the birthday of him. So let's get that straight now. Okay. Um, now, the other thing, too, is uh, we're going to talk about the miseducation of the Negro when it comes to European holidays, conceptual uh, deception, the Ten Commandments, and the laws of Mayotte. Um, also, we're going to talk about the transition of consciousness. Uh, we're going to talk about time and the law of germination. Uh, we're going to examine that because that's very important to um, our celebration of European holidays. Uh, worshiping false narratives. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, celebration. You know, we had the celebration of the harvest. We had the celebration of the sun. We had all types of celebrations, okay? Uh, we celebrated uh, when summer, winter, spring, or, or uh, fall came around because we saw the changes in the earth and in the heavens. And so we celebrated this. And like I said, this is uh, probably the secret behind why black folks want, like to celebrate a lot or like to party a lot. Um, and then we're going to talk about the fact that we're sick. Um, we are the only people that celebrate our own demise. Um, and we know this term is a uh, Stockholm syndrome. Okay, so let's talk about uh, celebrating European holidays and the origin and creation of false gods. Okay. Um, so again, um, we talked about the fact that all European holidays and the way that we uh, actually interpreted this too was based on fear, on fears. Um, Thanksgiving was based on the fear of starving to death. As I said, out of greed, the very people who taught them how to plant and also to harvest, they destroyed because they did not want to share the harvest that was coming with the people that kept them from starving to death. 
because again, now, you know, we get this narrative of people coming here and being civilized and having, you know, this superior intellect or what have you, when they were uh, floating flotillas of death because they were like a week away from starving in most cases like Christopher Colon, when they reached these islands where these black people were that kept them and, and whoever else, their children or what have you from starving to death. So these narratives are told but the truth is not told about the situation. So just like today, we can look at the fact of this, uh, what is this guy's name, who's trying to block the sun and also uh, depopulate the earth, okay? We can look at this same mentality that exists, and this is based on greed. I don't wanna share, like when you see two-year-olds playing, I don't want to share my toy or mine, you know. So this is this is actually what created this mentality amongst our people. Um, because again, we didn't have this type of selfishness um, ingrained in our culture. In fact, that was because, um, and I want to mention a book that I've mentioned on a couple of videos a few years back, Things Fall Apart. Uh, very important video because it showed uh, this prophecy from the Medu Netcher that talked about a fo uh, foreign people would come into our land and that would change our crop and harvest system. And this system is still used today against our people of supply and demand. Okay, so what they observed, our storehouses were always running over with seeds. So what they observed was that we're gonna take away your storehouses and then we're gonna ration out the seeds to you, which was always never enough to feed their families or their clan, okay? So this was a period where we use to worship when whenever we were planting or harvesting, we were singing praises to the creator, creatrix spirit. They observed this, immediately became jealous and envious of the fact that we had this spiritual connection that they knew nothing about. Okay, and so they seized the storehouses. Okay, now this story was plagiarized in the story of Joseph. And they talked about famine in Egypt and how um, the storehouses were basically empty. And Joseph had the, uh, was the one to help restore, uh, restore the storehouses full of seeds to plant. And that was directly plagiarized from, the, from this prophecy in the Medu Netcher about these foreigners coming into our land and changing the crop and harvest system. And this was very critical because again, this was deliberately done in order to make you now, instead of you worshiping together and praises to the real creator, not a man and a real creatrix, not a woman, then uh, instead of you worshiping and enjoying each other in harmony and righteousness and loving spirit, now you have to compete against these same people, okay, just to make sure you have enough seeds to plant to feed your family. So it became a competition just like this, uh, this communist manifesto that they still use. It's the same thing, so our survival of the fittest. Um, what they call it. But again, this was not in our nature. We didn't look at life of survival of the fittest because we always had everything we needed in our lands. But, you know, when you come out of a situation where there's no sun and there's ice on the ground and you can't plant and harvest, then it's almost like there's one plate of food left and you got 10 people fighting for that plate. So this is the type of system that they deliberately set up. Um, and he who can 
take the resources and control them or he who has the gold rules. And so this is the uh, theology that they lived by that was indoctrinated in our people, um, even through these holidays. Um, the, I was mentioning how at Christmas time or during the holidays between Halloween and New Year's that black men commit more robberies and home invasions, okay, and carjackings or whatever else you want to call it. There's a spike also in uh, murdering each other for fiat. There's a spike, a huge spike during this period. So not only do they take more money from us during this period than any other uh, group of all other groups in the United States. Um, it also causes this behavior, this self-destructive behavior in our men. Now, I want to mention something that a lot of sisters may not like, okay? Much of the information that was gathered when um, this subject was, when black men were talking about these subjects during this period, almost 90% of the black men that were interviewed said that it was because they needed or wanted and needed to be able to buy gifts for their women in order, um, in similar to Valentine's Day. And this is the type of craziness that has caused up. And on top of that, you don't get the credit for it. Somebody named Santa Claus does when you tell your children. Okay, so this is, you know, these are the type of psychological issues and mental health issues that we suffer during this period. So the prisons are, you know, refilled. Not only are they taking your money when you're spending it on gifts, um, they're also causing black men, your men, to do all of these things that will eventually end with half of them ending up in prison. So they hit you in three different ways. And then on top of that, most of the gifts that, that is bought um, basically loses its value within a week. You don't have the same desire, you know, for it. So these are things we have to examine because these holidays um, have done a real number on our people. But let's get back to the point that um, these holidays are rooted in fear. Okay. And, and we see this throughout all of the holidays. Now, we talked about Thanksgiving and the fear of starving to death, which, which caused um, this greed that we still live under today. You know, I got mine. You get yours the best way you can. Uh, a perfect example is when COVID first hit, okay, people knowing that there are millions of people well, in your neighborhood or your neighborhood store, there are thousands of people that have to have the same thing you have. But what did they show? Everybody trying to take the water and toilet paper as much as they can, not even thinking about the fact that other people need the same thing, okay? And we, we exhibit this same behavior because this is what we've been taught, okay? Um, Christmas is interesting when I started looking more deeply into the origins of Christmas and, um, you know, the different idols and gods and goddesses that they created around this. You can Google and look at all this stupid stuff. I'm not even going to take the time to go. That's not what's important. But I, dis I discovered that within the Christian uh, theology itself, there's a fear of the devil, a fear of demons getting them, the fear of evil spirits, and this is rooted in Christianity. Um, the, the other thing too you have to look at um, is that there's a constant fear of evil spirits. And, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we didn't have these concepts in our, we didn't see evil in the same sense that religion has taught us or this plantation theology has taught us. 
This never existed in our culture. Now we knew that there was an opposite force based on the law of polarity, okay? But we did not, you know, we, we weren't afraid of our ancestors coming back to haunt us. Like I said earlier, we poured libations to invoke um, or evoke the spirit of our ancestors. And that is the, the biggest difference, okay, that we can see in terms of what we celebrated, how we celebrated, and European holidays and how they have affected us. And, and, and it's so deep that during Christmas time, there's more, um, what was it uh, I saw? Uh, no, there's more suicides based on what I was talking about earlier, the inability to have fiat to buy these um, material things that have no value, um, but also this deep rooted fear. Okay, this is why um, shows like uh, Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead, the one that The Walking Dead that was the top rated cable show on television for years is because of this concept. We love our ancestors. We want our ancestors around us. And this was in stark contrast of what you have been taught and what you taught our children. Okay, deep rooted fear. So wh why is it, if you're celebrating a savior, why is all of this fear, okay, surrounding his birth why, uh, and within the constructs of, of this theology? It's very deep. Um, And then we look at Easter. Easter is the fear of sin and eternal punishment and damnation. Okay, so even on a day that you claim you're celebrating um, the rise, okay, and I want to talk about a couple of things surrounding, uh, surrounding Easter that has a profound impact on our people. Um, you know, that I'm going to look at a couple of scriptures in order <clears throat> for us to examine this. And see, one of the mistakes that we make is that we put things on a pedestal. And so uh, we we get angry when when we examine things that don't fit the narratives that we want or that we're comfortable with. Okay, but it's going to take a cocoon experience for our people, a metamorphosis for our people in order for us. When you see these wars that's going on in the physical realm, it's just an indication of the war of the spirit and the mind being manifested physically. Because remember, when you're dealing with people who don't have any self-control when it comes to things like greed, Uh, when it comes to things like killing people, when it comes to things like raping people, and doing all of these degraded acts against society, then we know that we have to look at a different realm of experience, okay, or be caught up into this. Because trust and believe, it's only poor children that are going to fight these evil wars and um, these uh, made up wars, okay? And all of these things that are going on uh, simply because of greed, that there's no other way to put it. Okay, but going back to um, Easter, the fear of sin, eternal punishment and damnation. Okay, when you're supposed to be celebrating, you know, your risen savior. Okay, but you have this deep-seated fear, okay, surrounding this event. Now, let's examine a couple of things. First of all, Luke said that uh, Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. But in the Gospel of John, he says that Jesus was still in court before Pontius Pilate at 12 noon. Now, If you're, if you're in, in a case and you're dealing with a case and you're investigating something, 
15, even 15 minutes is a long time. If there is a 15 minute um, uh, empty space between time, then that has to be explained because somebody can commit an act within 15 minutes. And it, so you have a three hour window here. When Luke clearly said he was crucified at 9 a.m. And, 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 and then uh, the apostle John said that uh, he was in court before Pontius Pilate at 12 o'clock. Now, one of them is a lie, okay? I don't care how you try to slice and dice this, one of these scenarios is a lie, if not both. The other thing too about Easter is in Matthew, uh, he talked about when Mary and these other women they went to the tomb, okay. They said that an angel came and uh, knocked the um, boulder or the stone away, okay. And they and asked them, well, who are you looking for? And, and um, they said, we're looking for Jesus. He said, he's not here. He is risen. But then when you look at uh, Mark, he says that there's two angels, okay, that were um, one at the head and one at the foot, but that Jesus was risen. Okay, and then a third scenario where um, Luke said that uh, when they went, when the women went, Mary and the other women went to the tomb, they saw two angels standing outside the tomb. Okay, so if I was being interrog interrogated for, uh, say, hypothetically, or you or uh, I, I, for a crime, and you got three or four different stories, you're going to get locked up, okay? If you committed a crime and you got four different scenarios, ain't nobody going to believe anything. The first thing they're going to say is, well, you changed your story four times. So we have to examine things, you know, critically and stop being led by narratives that we have no concept of where they came from and more importantly, what they are doing to us. So let's look at Halloween. Okay, Halloween, which is the fear of the devil and their dead ancestors, as I said earlier, coming back to haunt them. Uh, one of the first one um, was based on the sun, All Hallows Eve, okay, or Halos Eve. And then there was the Night of the Living Dead. Um, but this, this, all of this came out of uh, the Druidic New Year, okay, which is November 1st, so October 31st, was the eve of uh, the Druidic New Year, which the Druids came out of the Nile Valley civilization knowledge. Okay, so here again, this is the foundation of something you conceptualize that was totally twisted around. Okay, totally twisted around. Um, our people never feared death, okay? In fact, they prepared for death prior to. That's why when you look in all the tombs of the pharaohs, you see things that they could use when they went into their eternal existence. Okay. Um, the So this was October 31st was uh, also when the Europeans believed that the earth opened up and that the dead walked the earth. Okay, and uh, Sam Bain, which is uh, end of a of the summer celebration, they um, went up on the mountaintops and had ban uh, bonfires to ward away evil spirits. So again, the the contrast between how we viewed spirits through nature, the Netaru, okay and through our religious celebrations. Uh, I believe the Yoruba, uh, the Yoruba tradition, 
is another one. Um, I have a friend, Mayat, who practices, uh, who practices the spiritual art. Okay, but the point being that we always evoke the presence of our ancestors, where in contrast, people, other people were afraid of their ancestors coming. So uh, I read one narrative where uh, this one uh, lady was saying that the reason why they um, dressed up in different costumes is because they didn't want their ancestors to recognize them mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and take out some type of vengeance against them for something they did when they were alive. All kind of crazy stuff, okay? But uh, again, the major contrast is we poured libations or we pour libations to evoke the spirit of our ancestors. And finally, um, uh, this day, souls of the dead was uh, one day that they consulted Satan, uh, what they knew as Satan directly during that day. Um, so let, let's, let, let's discuss a few things, particularly when it comes to celebrations, regardless to what holiday it is. Um, but if, if other people can create their gods and goddesses, why can't you? In fact, uh, more importantly, they already exist. You just have to, um, to reclaim them back from the people that stole them. Okay, so when we just like, um, during, the, during the period of, uh, Kwanzaa is a period that was started by a black person to celebrate, you know, different days okay, that, that we evoked our heritage, okay? And, you know, when you look at these other people, and I say this all the time, I learn a lot from living in California because there are at least that I know 10 different cultures. And I study them, I look at the things they, <laughs> they do not, okay, unless they came from a country that religion has been the foundation of their um, indoctrination, which a lot of them from uh, Central America are, okay? So, but all, all the other people, they, they worship um, what you know as religion with people in their own cultures. I've been in their house, okay? I've been in their houses. I've seen the God and goddesses that they worship. It's not what you have on your wall and in your churches. So all of these things affect us in ways that we don't even comprehend. All right. Uh, the difference, as I was explaining earlier, the difference in the fundamental way in which we look at holidays. Okay. Okay. And when I say it, look at holiday, I'm talking about our people, what our people established before we were indoctrinated with this plantation theology. Um, the difference was we were in touch with nature and we correctly uh, interpreted the, their significance. So everything in nature had a purpose, had an assignment, the Neturu. So we, we looked at, that's why we didn't, de we, we didn't destroy nature. We didn't cut down all the trees. We didn't um, uh, put chemicals in the air, CO, to destroy the quality of the air. We, we, we didn't do things that affected the ionosphere. Okay, we didn't do that. Okay, because we looked at the planet as a part of us, the divine law of oneness, which it is or what they like to call the Akashic records, which is something different. It's the same basic um, concept, but just it, it actually plays out in a different way where that records all of the activity of all things. We're talking about the actual essence of everything where we didn't, where we respected, we didn't go out and big game hunt and kill animals just 
for the smell of blood and just to have a trophy up on your wall saying that you kill an animal. We, uh, we didn't do that, okay? Again, nature was a part of us. Um, and, and this is where this um, concept about that uh, we are supposed to uh, have dominion over the earth, which is a lie. This is, this is part of this misogynistic um, <clears throat> uh, God complex way of thinking. Okay, that has destroyed the planet and everything on the planet. Um, also, we did not create imps, leprechauns, gargoyles, demons, devils, and other instruments of fear. You, you kind of see what's happening here? So these symbols that are associated with these European holidays have put you in a literal state of fear because all of these things that I just mentioned, imps, leprechauns, gargoyles, demons, devils, and all these instruments of fear keep you in that mindset where again, at our core, at our foundational principles had nothing to do with fear. Okay, we didn't fear things uh, in the earth, okay? We also correctly interpreted the significance of the Netaru principle, the God and goddess and all of nature and creation, and also the built-in natural karma that comes from any type of destructive activity towards um, the Netaru in any form of nature. Okay. And uh, finally, the other uh, principle, the mother principle, principle was correctly interpreted by our people. We understood the concept of the cosmic egg um, and its relationship to Dignesh on the planet. We understood this. Okay. We didn't need anybody to tell us. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, the mother principle, or Newt, the goddess of the sky, okay, Geb, the father of the earth, okay, we, we knew these principles, okay, we live by these principles, whereas European holidays taught you just the opposite, to live in fear, okay, all right, let's see here. Y'all all right? Um, okay, so let's talk about, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about the transition of consciousness, the law of germination and time. And, and, and this is very, very important, okay? Because <clears throat> the, law, the law of germination um, teaches us something very important that has been taken away from our people. First of all, it taught us the principle of delayed gratification. Why? It's because there is a process in the law of germination before anything can be manifested. Okay. Um, in terms of your transition of consciousness, nature teaches us this. I, you know, I always use the caterpillar and the butterfly analogy, but I also use the analogy of, you know, the plant and harvest system that was taken away from our people, where we don't even have, we were the first farmers here, by the way. All of our farmland was taken and given to Europeans through the Homestead Act and other, and other ways. But the law of germination teaches us a very important principle about the transition of consciousness and time and the passage of time. So when, when that seed is planted in the ground, before it can take root, it has to have sunshine and water, before it can even take root, okay? So that takes time. Black people are very impatient now. One of the reasons is 
I mean, the separation from nature has really, really done a number on us. This is why you see so much impatience among our young people and even older people. Um, you know, this is, this is a direct result of us being disconnected from source energy and divine laws. So once that seed receives the water and sunshine and is planted in fertile soil, then the germination process begins. Okay. This takes a period of time. You don't just plant it today and tomorrow morning. You know, you see a big manifestation of a tree. It doesn't happen that way. Okay. But over time, and during this germination period, there are a lot of things going on. Okay. There are a lot of things going on that could um, hinder, okay, the manifestation of what you planted. Okay. And then there is the um, fact that during this period, you can get sidetracked. Okay, so when you talk about a transition of consciousness, okay, and the way that we celebrated things, we, we celebrated the transition of our consciousness from one state to another. Okay, and this is something that in European uh, history and folklore, lore, they didn't do, okay? Everything was right now. I'm, I'm gonna take your shit right now, it's mine. And don't ask for it back. That's, that's how it works, even to this day. Okay, um, the other thing too is, this, this is how this God complex caused us to start worshiping um, a man false gods and false neck narratives, okay? Where our griots taught us under tree, like we experienced the creator, creative spirit again in everything. So everywhere we went was the church. It, it was inside of us. It was not these edifices that you go in, okay? And, and worshiping these false gods, it was not that. Okay, it was not that. In fact, the trees were where we looked at, okay, as the place in which we could evoke the spirits to come underneath the trees where the griots taught us. Okay, and, and again, all we have to do is start embracing our own culture, which is already there. Everybody else has taken from it and built their societies and cultures from it. Why can't you? Your own culture and your own theology. Now, um, I heard something one time, um, and, and I don't remember exactly, but the point that he was trying to make was that um, religion served this purpose for us on the plantation, okay? But once we came off of that plantation, we no longer, well, for a short period of time, the church was the only place that we could gather to plan things. It, it wasn't just for religious purposes, okay? It was for the community to, in, in other words, it was like a city hall. Religion was just one aspect of it. But what happened was that you got so engrossed in the, uh, the narrative of religion and the emotional aspect of it that you forgot all the other aspects that you're supposed to be concerned with, okay, and talking about other than giving people your fiat that they told you was tithes and offerings. That's not the purpose of that. And there is no uh, uh, where in the Bible, other than the fact that, um, you know, the 10% was part of the uh, Roman tax system, okay, that you have picked up and somebody told you that uh, you're supposed to, that you will prosper from giving uh, this 10%. 
Okay, that is not how originally, because originally we gave what was necessary in order for for us to survive as a people. This is this is how we approach life. Okay, so we gave based on that, not based on the fact that somebody is going to take your money. Well, you're talking about a warlock. Okay, you're, you're talking about a pimp uh, in the pulpit and a warlock. Because on the one hand, you're dealing with spells. Okay. And on the other hand, anytime you take that fiat with those false gods on uh, that they worship, not our original symbols that they put on there. I'm talking about the spirit of it. Okay. Because, you know, all money is not good money. And when you take money from certain sources, it, it actually works against you. Okay. I learned this from uh, one of my teachers that, you know, one of the things they use against uh, black people as well with this fiat is the spell associated with it. Because you'll kill your own mama for it. Our children will kill you for it. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be some kind of um, something activated in it. But yeah, so you're, you're being pimped. Just like a prostitute, I know a lot of people are not going to like this, that has a pimp in the street on these holidays. Because you, here's the other um, thing, too. During these holidays, you give more money, okay, to these false gods than you do at any other time uh, during the year. And then on top of that, it's going to take you the next six months working two jobs to um, get the money back that you spent um, for these material things in order to place at the altar of these false gods. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the other thing too is celebration for what you call holidays was different for us, okay? Um, in the sense that, um, we celebrated something based on its purpose, okay? So if the, the purpose of harvest was for people to have abundance, we celebrated that, okay? And then also, as I mentioned earlier, two thirds of the year, we were celebrating the creator and nature. All right, so the, the basic principle in germination and metamorphosis is time. Okay, we, as I said, we sow the seed, the roots are planted, and then there's a manifestation. We never get to that point because we don't put down roots, okay, for anything as a people. And so we don't get a harvest or a manifestation. Other people get that. We put down roots, okay, for other causes. We plant seeds in other fertile uh, soil rather than our own. And so anything that takes root and manifests, we don't benefit from it. Um, so, you know, I, I just think that we've reached the time We've reached a time where we really have to um, examine the things that we do, the things that we believe in, why we believe in it, and more importantly, how these things are affecting us or causing us to live in fear on, at a subconscious level that uh, we are not aware of. Because if we were aware of it, we, we wouldn't live in fear uh, of uh, evoking our ancestors now. We're just as scared as they are <laughs> uh, uh, of what they call spirits or evil spirits or whatever. They have no power over you except for what fear is evoked. Um, there was a movie, there's a movie, I like horror movies by the way, so I know that might sound contradictory, uh, but uh, called Jeepers Creepers. And this creature 
actually the way he found his prey was through their fear. He could smell their fear. Okay, you, you even see uh, there are certain animals that they can smell your fear. Okay, so this element of fear that is ingrained in these European holidays have us in this condition that we're in today. That, um, you know, you, when you look in, in the Bible too, you know, you see a God that is telling certain people to kill everybody. Okay, but then you move from the God of the Old Testament to the New Testament, then you have a passive savior-like being, which we, um, this is a misnomer, okay, because he had a revolutionary spirit. If he, he went into the temple and turned over the, that's not a passive individual. Some people get shot doing something like that. So certainly um, this picture that's being painted of somebody that turned the other cheek for you to be meek and humble, the, the meek shall inherit the earth. Where? Where do you know, okay, or where have you ever seen the meek inheriting the earth? So all these plantation, all this plantation theology that you've been fed has done nothing but kill your spirit. That is what it was designed for. Okay. And, and that is exactly what it's done. And, the, and, and during the holiday season is when our people are affected more in a negative way than any other time of the year. We have to examine this when this is supposed to be a time of joyfulness, you know, happiness, sharing, you don't see this. All you see is selfishness. All you see is narcissism. This is because these are the types of fruits, the only type of fruits that can come out of a situation like this. You see more homeless people during uh, this time of year. You see these evil people turning up the heat on you. Okay, you see all of this. So how is it that our people can look at these European holidays, all of the trauma that they have brought our people? Because um, so if you come over here and the Pope is telling you to subdue everybody, how is that? Why do you have to kill people in order for them to worship God? I never understood that concept. That's crazy. There's no way that the creator of the universe who actually puts food here for all of us, gives us the sun and all of the other things we need, would then want to turn around and have everybody killed. That does not make any sense at all. So, <clears throat> Basically, um, just to wrap this up, um, we have to stop celebrating these European holidays. Now, if you want to get together with your family and do all this and that, but this other nonsense has got to stop because um, this is driving us not only more insane, okay, but it's, a, it's another ploy, okay, and that's all it is. It's another way to take all of your money almost 25% or 24% of black people are spending their money more than 24% of all other groups. You can look it up yourself. This is insanity. This is another reason why we're in the condition that we're in when we should be taken like the Jews do, okay, like the East Indian people I know do, okay, uh, taking your money, putting it together, and trying to build something for the upcoming year, because this is gonna be a tough winter for our people, because they have put things in place where they want to take us out. And again, you know, we're vulnerable because we're not, we don't help each other. We are vulnerable. So um, I just wanna employ our people. Okay, you don't have to believe me. 
look at what the fruits of these European holidays have produced in our people. The other thing um, too is um, that this is a way to damage your credit because if you're not able to pay for things because you spent all of it on gifts, okay, then you're, you, you know, you're traveling all over the country, you're spending money with the airlines, okay, during these holidays. That's another way to get your fiat, your hard earned fiat. Then black men, as I said earlier, are out here committing all these senseless crimes against the majority of it is against their own people and people calling them super predators, which we know who the real super predators are. Then when you commit all these degraded acts, they have a place to lock you up. Lance can tell you, you, you know, that more black men are locked up during this period of time than any other time of the year because they're out there trying to rob, steal, do whatever they can to get this fiat to make you happy over something that has no intrinsic value. And with that, Brother Lance, I, I think I'm going to close out. I don't know if you're around. I don't know. You may be napping. I know you uh, have had some full-blown days recently. Um, but uh, another area um, other than fear, okay, is hope. So um, they, what, what happens is there's a false sense of hope among our people, okay? And, and I'm here to tell you today that this blind faith and hope that we have, okay, in the system, in people that have shown you that they have no, no regards for you at all for hundreds of years, nothing has changed, nothing will change unless we start tearing down these spells that got us in the condition that we're in. So it has to start with, and then subconsciously, when you're, when you're celebrating these holidays, you're actually celebrating, okay? You're celebrating people, false gods, idols. You're celebrating a man and a woman. You're not celebrating the, because these holidays were created, okay, for uh, the worship of a man and a woman. They were not created to worship the creator and the creative spirit. There's no way because of all the things that I just mentioned to you. And, and here's the litmus test. If you have 95% of all of your experiences being negative, okay, or the manifestations of it, 95% is negative for our people, then why do you still have hope in something that has given you nothing but pain, suffering, and heartache, okay? But yet you still have hope in this, okay? And I know a lot of religious people gonna get upset about this, okay? And Islam too, okay, it's the same thing. Why do you have, why do you have to kill a whole bunch of people and who gives you that right to do that? Who, who gives you that right? You didn't create nobody. So tell me what God you are serving that gives you the right to kill hundreds and thousands and millions of people in the name of a religion. Who does that? Who, who gives you that right? But the other thing I want to say is... It's not these people they're talking about, terrorists or whatever the fuck they're talking about, that I'm worried about. It's these crazy homegrown terrorists that we have to defend ourselves against, that my people have to defend themselves against. Not these people they're talking about in these foreign lands. Those are not the people that's killing our people in the street. Those are not the people that are redlining us. Those are not the people that's keeping our people unemployed. Those are not the people 
that are doing all of these destructive things to our people. They are not. It's the homegrown terrorists, okay? And I don't even like that word because there's nothing supreme about it. The idiocracy, okay, that, that we are still dominated by, okay, because of kumbaya. So, you know, the only hope that we should have is in the hope that we embrace our true selves and then build on that, okay? Because, you know, I'll use one of your scriptures, faith without works is dead, okay? But but we don't like to talk about the, the scriptures that expose stuff. We like to keep those hidden, but we like to quote the scriptures that are part of the plantation theology. Uh, slaves obey your masters in the flesh. Really? For what? Now, why would I do that? For somebody that has split my back open, that have me in a field working 16 hours a day, that cut the, the babies out of my wife's pregnant stomach, why, why would I do that? Why would I want to obey something like that? And see, all of this is stuff that we have, because the reason, another reason why we have this destructive behavior, because all this pain is inside of us because we don't want to talk about it. But then we strike out at another brother and sister and try to tear them down or kill them, kill their spirit because of the pain that's been inflicted upon us. And when you go to these, when you celebrate these holidays and you go around each other, that's the most miserable time of the year. Because we're pretending to be happy when we're not. Black folks are catching hell in this country. Okay. We're catching pure hell. So, you know, if you're, if you're comfortable with uh, waiting to see if you go to a mythical heaven or hell, then I guess it is what it is, okay? But uh, the fact of the matter is that each day that sun come up, we are being pushed further and further behind. You see the agenda that they have, bringing people who have nothing to your communities um, in order to, to justify taking away the little resources that your taxes pay for, uh, the little resources that you have, okay? And, that, and, and you know, they tell our people all of this stuff about welfare, okay? Do you know that corporate welfare is the largest aspect of welfare in this country or in the world? The largest group of people receiving welfare is white women with children. It's always been that way. Okay, you can look up the statistics. So why are our women associated with this? Why are black people associated with this? For what reason? When the statistics say something totally opposite. So again, we need to come from under a rock, look at the situation, look in the mirror, look at our black selves and say, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with us? And then you can examine the things that are wrong with us like we did today. And this will give you your answer. So I hope Brother Lance made it back. Not sure. Oh, I've oh, been back okay. yeah, for okay, a while. Brother. I know you had a busy uh, week and weekend. I was thinking maybe you was uh, in that realm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because <laughs> when, when the body and mind shut down, it, there is nothing you can do. No, I know that. I know that. And um, yeah. I've, I've learned to be tricking the book. Yeah. Keep us going, but not now where I, I give in. I give in when yeah. fatigue comes because That's good. your body is best. That's and good. when I wake up, I wake up 
like a charging, raging bull. Running after <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I already know what I'm going to do in the morning and in the day. And, you know, I have an idea. And then I say, okay, if I get a good rest tonight, right now, between rounds, when I wake up, I'll be very strong. Because I realize that if I push it and I'm working at 60% or 50%, right. the same time goes by, but I'm half effective. So why yeah. not be up? And be a hundred percent effective and alert, and it's sunny, and I'm breezing through stuff. You know yeah. what I mean? So I don't mind yeah. pushing it. To, to to I'll slow down a little bit when the evening goes by and it gets into the wee hours. Because for me right now, it's nine forty six. Yeah. And people that I yeah. people that I know here in Ghana, they're like, hey, you know, I'm turning in right now because it's a different culture. If you don't have to stay up, you're not staying up. They're not a stay up artificially stimulated sugar TV watching. You know what I mean? Right. They get to be right. here. These yeah. folks will wake up 3.34 in the morning to get somewhere 6 or 7 if they have to. So it, it's really yeah. early, and it's affecting me in a good way. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. I can roll with that. I feel like an oddball sometimes staying up late, and then I'm five hours ahead of the East Coast. So, right. you know, right. yeah. So I try to have shows around the clock, so I'll be uh, putting up stuff late, but I might be sleeping when I do that. So it'll yeah. keep the cold. So, yeah, yeah I just want to you see effectiveness brother and you are very effective in what you do to do this every single week consistently with the strength and the torque that you bring the power behind it it shows that you've been consistent with this for a long long time because it ebbs and flows out of every pore of your body mind and soul so i'm appreciative of that and again thanks for the condolences for michael hamer's transition but it's also for all of us. Yeah. And um, I'm getting them phone calls, man, a lot. And it gives me a sense of urgency, not where I'm scared. No, I'm not scared. I'm running into it, mm-hmm. not running toward it. We all want to stay to get our job done, but it gives me more of a sense of urgency. And mm-hmm. it's a beautiful thing like I was saying earlier on, and I'll shut up after a minute, that now I have found myself in a place where I can dedicate myself as much as I want without any outside distraction. So in essence, I can chill and still get more done and I will be getting yeah. more done. You yeah. know, um, that's what it is. That's what it is. And I, and I feel good. I'm supposed yeah. to be where I am. I don't mean just physically in West Africa. I'm not knocking that. I'm saying in the place of my life where I can focus on things and creativity comes to me much easier. I don't have to reach for it. You know, when you fight right. somebody, yeah. if they're jumping around and you got to reset your feet, you can't really hit them. But if it yeah. comes at you and stands there in front of you, oh, you got them. So oh, yeah. the strategy now is that everything I hope to do is right there in front of my face. I did some different graphics a little early on for different platforms and just perfecting, perfecting, perfecting with the body of work that we had Michael Hamer on. We had Brother Hollow on. We got a couple of videos with them, but I oh. want to keep going. And maybe it may be my time tomorrow or 10 years or 50 years from now. I don't worry about that. Right now, I'm swinging to the fence. I'm going for the KO, and that's all we want to really focus on doing. Yes, sir. My, my purpose and, and bringing light into the world from my end of things. You that's know? right. So, well, yeah. you, do, you, you do a great job at that, bro. Yeah, and you do a great What? Listen, that's why I'm sitting here with you. You know what right. I mean? You got to prune away and peel away, and you know the fraudulent people reveal themselves, but you keep going because if you're true to the mission, and you're yeah. really about it. Yeah. You can't have anybody around you half behind him. That's and you're right. real. You're That's real, true. brother. I, I, I thank you for that. Well, thank you, brother Lance. And uh, <laughs> have a good uh, week. I'm going to try to keep up with you. And uh, keep, keep <laughs> We're going to put it alone with you. It's a beautiful <laughs> thing, you. brother. Yes, always, brother. Thank you All so right. much. Peace and love, right. brother Lance. Always, brother. Thank you so much. All right. Peace.